Welcome to the Thriving Farmers Podcast, where our mission is to inspire, educate, and celebrate sustainable farming. We believe that you can build a profitable and sustainable farm that gives you true farm freedom. Join us as we talk to farmers, innovators, educators, and entrepreneurs to glean their top takeaways in business and life. Today's podcast episode is a live training, actually, that we did with Ellen Polishuk. And um, we brought Ellen on last fall to talk about her new book, Start Your Farm, and all the things that go into starting a farm. And so we dive in deep on that. And so many people asked about this interview and like, I'd love to see this in a podcast form that we decided would take the, the Rob interview, turn it into a podcast for you guys. Um, we'll, we'll have Ellen on again um, at a later point. So if you guys have questions, follow-up questions, feel free to to reach out to us as a team and we'll make sure they get incorporated into the next interview we do with her. So in this episode, we went into starting your farm deep. We talked about the challenges. We talked about the aspects of profitability, what it means to do a triple bottom line. We talked about you know some of the limiting factors that can stifle success. Um, we talked about what's necessary to be a farmer and the different skills that you'll need to have. So enjoy this episode. It's a great one. Ellen's a incredible resource to the community and reach out if you have any further questions. Well, welcome everybody. We are live tonight with Ellen Polishuk. Is that how you pronounce it? Polishuk, that's very good. All right. <laughs> and we are talking about her new book, which she was uh, gracious to the send me last week called Start Your Farm. And I kind of dove in and um, checked it out. And I am really, really impressed because a lot of people, when they talk about farming, they talk about farms, they go ahead and discuss about the actual, you know, you need to plant the seed here or you need to grow this crop. But what Ellen does and what Forrest do, because it's co-written between the two, and it's a great trade-off. Ellen does a chapter, Forrest does a tractor back and forth, is it really goes into what it takes to start a farm, um, a lot of the big picture principles that you need to think about as you're starting that farm, whether it be sales or soils, and then to kind of, you know, gauging success, what does success look like for you? And to the important part that there's going to be failure in anything you do and recognizing that. So welcome, Ellen. Thank you. Yeah. Why don't you go ahead and take a couple minutes to give us a little bit of background. Tell us how you started your journey as an organic farmer, and then now you've moved on to more of the educational space. Yeah. Hi. Thank you. It's nice to be here. My name is Ellen Polishuk, and I'm talking to you from my little den, my beautiful part of the world in uh, Maryland. I'm a little bit outside of Washington, D.C., and uh, I've spent my life up to this point growing plants and vegetables in particular. I did get a degree from uh, Virginia Tech as a young person. Uh, after I started my very first farm job at age 16 at Potomac Vegetable Farms right outside Washington, D.C. in Virginia. And I was so taken with the whole idea of farming, and which I had never known anything about. I grew up on a cul-de-sac in the suburbs. And that started the beginning of my journey into agriculture. And I did end up going to Virginia Tech and getting a horticulture degree, which is a great background to have at any point along the way. It's nice to have that with you. So after my college years, I went back to Potomac Vegetable Farms where they rehired me as a grown-up person with skills and, and education, and they gave me a whole farm to manage. And so I spent the last 25 years of my life taking a big open piece of land with a lot of Johnson grass on it and turning it into a diversified, vibrant, biologically active vegetable farm. So that's my farming career. Um, last year, I decided to put down my hoe, so to speak, uh, and focus on taking my knowledge and excitement about plants and about agriculture and about farming as a business and develop a full-time teaching and consulting business. So I do a lot of workshops. That's my favorite way to teach is live with people in the room with me that's gives me a lot of energy and a lot of feedback. And so I teach at a lot of growers conferences all around the country. Other growers, just like me, small time, um, small-ish growers in the sense of agriculture and mostly direct market retail and so forth. So I tilled 20 acres of ground and grew on that 10 acres of vegetables and 10 acres of cover crops. And that was the rotation, one year on, one year off. 
and grossed around three to four hundred thousand dollars a year. So that was the scale at which I operated. Now, tell me about the markets for that farm. Were you right into New York City? Was it CSA? This is near Washington, D.C. Yep. And yeah, we had a very strong CSA that was many, many years old. We got in fairly early in the game. We also went to lots of farmers markets, some of which we've been at for 38 years. Oh, wow. Is, um, I'm a fully grown up person. That tells you how long. And, uh, and we've had roadside stands also. So we are right in the, you know, I was, my farm was one hour from the city center and yeah. partners that I work with, they had another farm even closer to the city. So yeah, all retail, good price structure, really a beautiful market to be able to sell into. Yeah, absolutely. That's a lot absolutely. of fun when you have a strong market and all you have to really focus on is growing those vegetables. I mean, obviously there is marketing involved, but it's not, you know, you're not fighting for every dollar. Right. Exactly. So. You know, one of the things, too, that you started the kind of the book off with was talking about what it takes to be a farmer. And, you know, I think some people are out there say, well, if you dream it, you can do it. But I think with farming, it can be there can be some challenges involved. Do you want to go into that a bit? Yeah, you had to let me know you were interested in this question of what does it take to be a farmer? And uh, I guess part of the thing that is as attractive to me about farming is that it is so multidisciplinary. Mm hmm. And especially if you're going to own your own operation and not, you know, maybe work at an institution where somebody, where there's other staff members dealing with other parts of the business. If you're really going to run your own show, not only do you need to be a plants person, but you need to be a business person and you need to know how to put the money in the bank and you need to know how to work with an accountant. And then you got to be an electrician and a plumber and a carpenter a little bit. And then you're also a boss and you're a marketer. And so it's so complicated and so interesting that you're never done learning how to get better at it. And so that was always attractive to me. And that's one of the things we really focus on in the book is that being a farmer is wearing a lot of hats yeah. as it is. And so I would say it takes someone who not only has passion for the whole concept of farming and has that love of the plants and the sun and the yeah. wind and the soil, but wants to have all these different kinds of challenges coming forward. And yeah. not everybody is really suited for that many kinds of, of work to have in front of them and to be able to motivate themselves. Nobody else is going to tell you which thing it is is the most important to do right now. So a real, as they say in a job description, a real self-starter, right? Yeah. You're the one that's got to be able to start your own engine and yeah. you know jump out of the house and go. Yeah. So yeah. I think those are some of the important features. Yeah, you have to be an orchestrator for everything because you're not only keeping all those hats, but a lot of the times you're keeping employees going too. Yeah, so the leadership aspect is key too of just being able to, and farming can be really frustrating and really wet and cold sometimes. And so being able to motivate people too is also important as well. One other thing I like to say is that I think important for a farmer to be able to be okay with things not being perfect. And oh. Yes. With things never being done, you know, like a farm, because it's a living organism, it's never finished developing and growing and changing. And your list of what is possible for you to do is never ends. Yeah. And so there are some people I think that that gives them a, a level, a low level of stress that they are never done and that doesn't feel good to them. And that would be really hard to do for a lot of years in a row. Yes. We had friends that had a, started a farm an hour south of us or so, did a great job of setting things up, but they ended up only doing it for about five or six years. And then they say, you know what? We want to have a family. We want to do some other stuff. This is just not where we need to be. And one of the biggest thing, challenges they faced was I think both of them were a lot of perfectionistic. Yep. And so you have to be willing to say, all right, the weeds got the carrots. Let's till them under and try again. Right. Let's do something else. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about those on a farm. There's frequently, every farm is different. There's no cookie cutter farm. Um, right. But in some of the farms too, there's some limiting factors which can stifle success. And uh, that may be like, okay, this is just not for you. Or, hey, this is a problem you're dealing with, but you can work around it. Can you get into some of those issues that farmers sure. might face? Sure. Um, I would say off the top, top of the list is resource limitation. 
Mm. So this is kind of so obvious. You think maybe you don't need to talk about it, but I find that I do need to talk about it when I'm working with people who are really, really at the beginnings of their journey. And the two most important resources are time and money. Mm -hmm. And so what I face as a consultant sometimes is I have a person come to me who has got neither time nor money. <laughs> That's so the basically, worst. basically, they're saying, this is my first year. I don't have any other income and I have no budget for fertilizer or tools. And it's like, I'm pretty sure I don't know how to work around all of that, actually. Yeah. So yeah. that's the first set of resources that you need to have at least one, if not both. And yeah. time, when I talk about time, I mean time to develop your systems. Basically time to have where the economic pressure is not so strong for you to succeed. That yeah. you have time to develop your infrastructure, your management systems, and your soils. And figure out how is everything going to work on this land? So yeah. time and money would be the first resources that could really just be the end of it. And then yeah. soil resource, I think, is um, undervalued by yeah. people who are starting up. You know, I don't know what they're thinking, but they're not thinking about buying a farm that has, or, or a place, or getting access to a place that has really good soil. And you can fix some things, but it takes time and money to fix yeah. broken soils. And yeah. so if you can keep that in mind as you're looking at places to either rent or buy, I would keep all of those things in mind. So yeah. that's, those are sort of the most obvious limiting factors. Then once you get down to this whole next tier, now we're talking about you know temperament. What is your temperament? Are you able to instruct and inspire others to work with you? How yeah. are you with your marketing? Can you get your message across? What is your technical skill level with actually getting your equipment to work, the greenhouse temperature stays the right number, and you grow beautiful plants? Yeah. So there's a lot of places where things can fall apart. But yeah. I would say those top three are really time, money, and soil are mm. the first ones to address, and then you can get into this other level. Yeah. Yeah, over my career, I was privileged to intern and work for a couple different other farms. And the first guy I worked for, he was one of Cornell's top students for years and ran one of the research farms. And his technicality of growing was off the charts. Phenomenal. Stuff was beautiful, but he could not fix anything of his own equipment. He had not the least bit. So I actually, as a 16-year-old, was out there cranking on stuff with a wrench. All right. He thought I was the bee's knees. <laughs> because, That's awesome. Yeah, because, yeah, but, you know, it just wasn't his strength. But he brought in people that could help him fix that problem because, again, he was a technically perfect grower and yeah. could bring in really nice quality product. There's a lot of places where you can buy in expertise that you're missing. But yeah. you can't buy in someone to conceive of your farm, to yeah. have it all an understanding of it in your head, and you can't hire someone really to be the boss. Yeah. You've got to be the good boss. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah. we are having a bunch of people join us. So hi, Stephanie. Hi, Trace. Hi, Seth. If you want to uh, drop, start dropping some questions in at the end of kind of my questions I had for Ellen, we'll go over your questions. If you guys want to go ahead and do that, that'd be great. Um, and thank you so much for joining us tonight. We will have the replay available for a while, so you can watch that for a while. But it's always special when we get to talk to someone who's been in the trenches for a long time. And That's right. <laughs> seen a lot of seasons of different things happening. To that point, Ellen, this is actually not a question I had down here, but right now the East Coast is getting hit by a hurricane. Did you experience storms like that during your farming career? And kind of what are the top tips you might have for people? Wow, that's a good one. You know, every year we have said to ourselves, I think the weather is really weird this year, don't you? Yes. And then you realize that you've said that every year that you've been farming. <laughs> but I have been at this for 35 years, and I would say that the weather is getting, it is getting weirder yes. <laughs> than, it, than it ever was. So no disputing that. Since we're a little bit north, we're in, you know, in Virginia up towards D.C., we're not in the hottest spot for hurricanes, but we certainly have had our share of, you know, crazy amounts of snow where you're out battling, uh, your tunnels getting crushed. One of my favorite foul weather stories was in a hurricane. We had a hurricane come nearby in August. 
which of course is the height of your tomato season, which for us means this is it, man. These are our biggest market totals of the year. Yeah. And they yeah. called off market. They said, you know, oh. like Friday, they said Saturday market is closed. So what did we do? We had already picked everything, right? You don't go out and pick tomatoes for market. You pick tomatoes on Wednesday because it's Wednesday. Yes. You want to be picked. So we had all this fruit ready to go. We didn't pick all the extra stuff, you know, the basil and and all that other stuff. And we went anyway. We went with our sprinter full of tomatoes. That was it. And we stood in the pouring rain. It wasn't that windy. It wasn't dangerous that we were there. And we made $3,000 in the pouring rain. (laughs) It was unbelievable. We just said, we're going to round everything off to the nearest paper dollar. This was before, (laughs) this was before credit cards were at market very commonly. And we said, just give us some dollars and we'll put them over in this bucket. And then when I got home, I had to put the money in the clothes dryer because it was all completely soaked. And it turns out that you can put money in the dryer and it all works out. Well, that's a new one for me. (laughs) That's a long story for your question. But I I agree and I understand that this kind of weather craziness is really tests the resiliency, both of the psychology of the team and of the systems that you've created. And, and I think it plays into our natural strengths as organic growers. Because yeah. resilience is what we get as one of our payoffs for yeah. being really good organic growers. Yeah. The more organic matter you have in the soil, the more water will come in and then through instead of filling up and running off, right? So all yeah. those things about organic matter they really do start to come into play when we have these crazy rain events. Yes. So yeah. good on us. And it's always yeah. good to keep remembering that sometimes when you're thinking, oh, why am I worrying about this cover crop? Why am I worrying about this Sudan grass? How am I going to, you know, all those yeah. technical worries is, is that you're building that capacity to withstand craziness. Yeah. That's resilience. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You know, one of the things that I, I, I meant to mention when you were talking earlier about, you know, when you're starting the farm, you frequently don't work on your soil, is that so many new farmers don't know what success looks like. Right. And so they think the fact that they have a lettuce plant that's this big is amazing, where they don't realize lettuce can actually get this big. Right. And it's actually quite easy to get it there. And yeah. so their yields on an acre are one eighth to one tenth of what they could be. And so they frequently get very discouraged very quickly. And if they had just known what their soil could produce, they yeah. would say, all right, we got an issue. We got to fix that issue and still be farming today instead of being, you know, a banker or something else today and they right. can't farm. Yeah, good point. I think it's important. You know, we talk, we have a whole chapter in the book about education. Yes. Where, where to gain different skills what is, is it worth it to get a four-year degree, blah, blah, blah. But we are both, Forrest and I, just feel very strongly that it makes the most sense to educate yourself on somebody else's farm while you're getting paid, right? Get paid to learn on somebody else's dime and somebody else taking all the risk. And just get a number of seasons under your belt. So exactly as you say, you know what's possible. What does a good pepper crop actually look like? How heavy should those fruit be hanging off that plant? What is good germination of a carrot patch? How many do you really want to see, you know? That's a subjective question right there. (laughs) And then once you've got that, some of that experience on one farm, that's what you want to get connected to your local extension service and you want to go to field days and you want to go to conferences and, and look at pictures and you want to get in front of other people's products and yeah. plants and say, oh, I never, my potatoes have never looked that good and they're right down the street. So it is totally possible for me yeah. to do that and find out what it is you need to do. Yeah. One of the things, you know, obviously we interned with a couple different farmers, but 
to that point, there's such a breadth of growing. And though a couple of farmers we interned with and were near really didn't take to greenhouse tomatoes to the level they could have, they were still doing you know, basket weave outside um, or you know doing determinants in a tunnel or something. So I remember one uh, field day, which I would really decide I didn't want to go. It was two hours south of us. It was yeah. just not going to fit into my schedule. But my mentor actually called me up and said, look, you need to go to this. This is very important. So I went. And it completely changed my, again, what success looks like yep. for tomatoes. And I saw that you can grow them 20 feet tall in the greenhouse, 20 feet long because you lower and lean. Yep. Um, you can harvest 20, 30, 40 pounds per plant if they're grafted and if you have the right fertility program for them. And yep. it completely changed how we did tomatoes on our farm. Those four hours returned thousands of dollars for just that little investment. Yep. I am, I'm totally with you. I, the same thing has happened to me, you know, over and over and over again, whether it's completely changing my idea about how to do rotation on my farm, mm -hmm. fertility, very specific growing methods. I'm all over it. I'm with you. Yeah, cool. So I think we kind of talked about a little bit about the different learning models. But, you know, one of the things, too, is there's people that hit the farming scene at different ages. Yeah. So like you may have been a teenager, other people, like some of the people we work with are middle age and they're trying to transition from a job they hate or one that's just not fun for them anymore. Yeah. So what would you say to that person that's further in the thing that, you know, they may not have a lot of time to go intern. What are some options for them that you have seen work? Um, I have a friend and colleague who uh, I've just written an article about. It'll be in, coming up and growing for market in the next few months. And he's oh, at Sassafras Creek Farm in Southern Maryland. You know him. Yeah. He's a wonderful guy. And he very successfully transitioned from a full-time 25-year career in the military to full-time successful vegetable farming. And yes. he took a lot of time to line it all up. So he didn't stop his one career and then begin farming. He crept in gradually. He and his wife just went crazy on educating themselves. Yep. So they read all these books and they went to all these conferences. And then they were relentless at calling farmers and saying, can I come and see your place? And they visited some of the most famous vegetable growers on the East Coast just because they called up and said, may we please come? Now, yeah. I probably shouldn't say that to too many people. But, and then he joined a program in Maryland for beginning farmers. Yep. Where he apprenticed, he, he could carve out one day a week when he could go to somebody's farm and work and watch all the systems over a whole season one mm. day a week. And then he put together a beautiful farm. It's just incredible. Yes. So that's the perfect scenario where you have yeah. plenty of time to step in so that when you finish the one career, your business, your land, and your systems are already starting to come into place. Yeah. The good news with many of those folks who are, you know, whatever, in their 40s or 50s is they have some financial cushion. That's the most fun is if that economic pressure isn't too hard, yeah. you got to make a big profit right off the bat. Yeah, and they can invest in some good technology and some good systems, which makes the turning of that profit so much faster as well. Exactly. And then, yeah. of course, those are oftentimes who my customers are. You know, they have money and they are like, I don't know how to do this. I'm going to pay somebody to help me figure it out. And so yeah. then I get hired to work yeah. on whatever, fertility, irrigation, marketing, yeah. whatever it is. And they're not afraid to ask for help. And they have resources. I think that right there is a major issue. And it's not just an issue with farmers, it's an issue all across business and industry is that so many people feel like if they don't figure it out themselves, they're not doing it right. But I'm the first to admit that I've started multiple businesses. And the first thing that I do in every single business I start is I go out and figure out how, who's best in that industry and try to figure out where my way into working with them. Um, <laughs> That's right. And I've gotten kind of good at it. <laughs> so, um, you recommend it, actually. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, I mean, we, we apprenticed with Paul and Sandy Arnold, who are in the Northeast, I think uh -huh. some of the most highly regarded farmers. Now we're doing a lot of more of the online training and stuff. And we've been incredibly grateful to be able to work with some people in that industry that have been incredibly successful and just have a huge heart to be able to share some of that stuff, which yeah. does grow our company. Because you know, again, anytime you start a new company, there's a number of years that it takes to figure it out. 
Yep. So it's made that span of figuring that out so much faster for us. And I'm not here because I'm some smart guy. I'm here because I realized I needed help and reached out. Yeah, you figure out who to ask. Exactly. Yep. But so, I have to say, compared to when I was a pup, there are so many more resources available. You know, there are so many good books out now with the, you know, the Lean Farm and Jean-Marc yeah. Fortier's book. Yes. And Gary Zimmer's book. And, you know, and now your book. And hopefully <laughs> this one too. And then there's the YouTube. There are so yes. many ways and there's such good information. It's really a great time to get into this business in that sense. It's not all a big mystery that you have to solve every riddle. It's great. Yeah, you're right. There is endless resources now. And with the internet, I mean, 20 years ago, we couldn't do this. Right. Yeah, it's, it's unbelievable what could be happening. I'm sure, you know, one of the things I did want to talk about is the process of writing the book with Forrest. I'm sure that was done, obviously, through the web. But talk to us a little bit about that process. And yeah, now he's relatively close to you. Yeah, about 30 minutes away. Oh, fun. And so, but believe it or not, we hardly ever see each other. You know? Okay. So yes. um, the story with Forrest and I is that he's 10 years younger than me or so, and he's a full-time sixth generation farmer, and he does all grass-based animal production, yep. all, you know, free range animals. So, but I'm older than him and I was in the markets in the DC area before he was, as he okay. was coming up in his career. Yeah. And I actually got him his, a really great spot in one of the best markets in DC way back, um, I don't even remember, 20 years ago. Yeah. He was one of the first growers that actually had clean, humanely grown meat. This was before it was normal. He was oh, on wow. the cutting edge. And, and I said, oh my gosh, you got to come to our market. People are going to love your stuff. Yeah. So that's how we met. And then we were at market every Saturday for the next 20 years. Yes. And he's an accomplished writer already. He's got two yeah. books under his belt. And so this book was his idea. Okay. He had the title. And he had the concept and he came to me and said, will you write this book with me? I think it would be much better with two of us than with just myself. And I said, of course I would love to. Yeah. And so we figured that we made a good combination. We didn't have geographical diversity because we're from the same state. Yeah. But it was man and woman, vegetable and animal, older, a little bit less old, you know, first generation farmer from the suburbs somebody who's had it in their family. So we figured that we had enough of that uh, diversity of experience yeah. that we could bring to the table. And so the, the whole impulse was, there's a lot of people out here who want to start farming. And we just had never seen a book that talked about the things that we thought needed to be talked about. Yeah. Besides the how to grow it piece. Yeah. There's a lot of really good books on how to grow it. There's good soils books. There's yeah. some straight up farm business accounting books, but yeah. we didn't find anything out there. We thought it was missing. And, and that was the idea is that we would fill this gap that we thought was necessary because we have the same goal as you. We want more growers to succeed, whether yeah. they're brand new or they're five years down the road, or I work with people who are 20 years down the road because we both believe deeply in this movement of growing beautiful food for people. Yeah. Yeah. Jeremy just commented. He said his first book really inspired me. And yes, I listened to his first book on tape when I interned at Polyface for the summer. One of my trips down during that summer, I believe that was, I listened to his book on tape for the trip down. Gaining um, ground. It's a beautiful yeah, story. It is. It's a great story. And he tells it with a ton of honesty too, which is great because I think a lot of people romanticize the farm. And yeah, there's amazing things that happen on the farm. It's one of the best lifestyles ever. I mean, we're, you know, on a tiny third of an acre plot in town here, but we still grow and about half of our land is we grow vegetables. And that's the favorite part of the kid's day is going out there, picking the vegetables in the soil, picking for the worms, getting dirty. And then we come in and have baths. <laughs> But it's just that connection to the soil and that connection to the earth and it can teach you so much and it's just growing stuff and knowing that it came from 30 feet away when you're eating it is there's just nothing like that. 
but it also can be hell. (laughs) And you know that. So I think that's, you know, that's one of the things that he brought out in that first book was, hey, it's not all fun and games sometimes. And that's one of the reasons he wrote the books he's did. And now that you've written this book, I think it really gives people some concrete stuff to think about so that they don't get overwhelmed in the first year. Yep. We have a whole chapter on failure. Which, yes. So I hope that people come away with just exactly what you said is a feeling of real honesty. Yes, there's things that we've learned that are, you know, impressive and you want to crow about them. And we've made so many mistakes. And that's okay. That's part of this learning and growing process. Everybody's got tons of mistakes. You just yeah. have to make sure that the good stuff just stays a little bit above the failures and then you're all yes. set. It was a wonderful process. Uh, Forrest is a, a gifted writer. He's funny as anything to work yeah. with. And he has like no ego about the whole thing. That's awesome. That's it was really just awesome. A- amazingly yeah. seamless to work together. Uh-huh. I had no idea it was going to be that smooth in a relationship sense. It was great. Yeah, that's awesome. I mean, it is a monumental task for writing a book. So, but, you know, obviously co-writing with someone probably took a little bit of that fear away. Yeah. Well, I mean, he put out the coattails and I, I grabbed on and off we went, you know, yeah. because he'd done it before. He was definitely the wise one. But when it comes to just you being in the trenches with your computer screen, trying to squeeze out some words, then, then you're all on your own. Yes. <laughs> yeah. 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 It just takes time. Yeah. So one of the things too, that you talk a lot about, you present a lot about, and in the book you talk a lot about is the soil. And, you know, one of the things I see that farms fail is that they buy a piece of property that's not suited for them, especially vegetable farms, because animal farms can take a lot of forgiveness. Vegetable farms are very picky. Can you kind of dive into soil a little bit, talk a little bit about what they're looking for and some of the common mistakes you see happening? Yeah. First of all, people come at this from different ways. Some people, the land comes first. Yes. That's not as usual. More people want to have land and then they go out searching for it. So you have to think about what are the parameters that are going to make that kind of farm successful. So as you say, an animal farm where you're not going to be doing any tillage is certainly you can you can install that onto a lot of different landscapes, even ones with trees on them. Right. Yeah. You can run your yeah. hogs right through the forest. You can run chickens through the forest. But if you're going to be a vegetable grower, and we're not even going to talk about grain, you know, nobody's going to go out and buy a thousand acres of wheat land. Then you have to have land that literally is not too hilly, not too full of rocks, not too washed away, not going to flood on a super regular basis besides hurricanes. So those are just some of the most basic sort of geographic or geological considerations that will make a vegetable farm possible. And then comes getting deeper into, is the soil resource actually appropriate for growing the kinds of food that you want to grow? And that's when you want to start working with either extension service or the soil web service on the computer, where you actually can start looking at maps of your county of which are the soils that are the ones that grow things well. Why don't you start with that? Yeah. And I know that may seem like a bass backwards way to get at it, but I mean, just because you find a place that's in a good location, if it doesn't have the right soils on it, your life is going to be harder and it's going to be harder for a long time. So we can fix a lot of things. But like I said before, it takes a lot of time and sometimes a lot of money to fix really broken soils. Yeah. You want to try to have a sense of the innate fertility of the soil. How was it born from a geological perspective? Is it going to be okay? And then you have to think about, well, what has anybody else done to this in the last 20 years? You know, I, I got somebody who sent me a soil sample of a horse ring. And he wants to try to turn up. It's like a third of an acre field, but it was a horse riding ring. Well, the soil test on it is insane. It's like things I've never seen before because it's not a natural situation, right? It's like yes. it's crazy. And so, yeah. you know, make sure it wasn't something that was poisonous, right? Like for some reason would have had a lot of pesticides on it mm-hmm. or that hasn't been disturbed in some way where somebody scraped off all this, all the topsoil and rolled over it with a steamroller. 
and turned it into a part, you know, whatever. So just some kind of obvious things. It's that yeah. part about looking at those soils maps that people are just don't commonly do when they're out looking for property. Yeah. Yeah. I've done my fair share of looking at property for, you know, clients, for myself. I mean, we, when we were farming in New York, we farmed seven different properties. It was spread over about a four mile radius. So it was, uh, you know, I was always looking for more land. Thankfully, we picked up some beautiful river bottom, you know, class nice. one black chocolate cake soils, which did flood once in a while, which was the bad part. <laughs> but, you know, yeah, I mean, you see people that pick up a farm that's heavy clay and then try to do greens production on it, whether, you know, they have to plant every single week and they frequently go out of business just because it won't support that hard. for them. Yeah. yeah, it's just too hard. Um, talk to us a little bit about marketing. So where you did, you were selling into the DC area and had a couple different streams. I think that's one of the number one thing that we see people struggle with. Why do you think that is? And what are some new and emerging markets that you're seeing people tapping into? Interesting. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting time to be coming into this marketplace because of course it depends on where you are, right? Yeah. So if you're within three hour drive of New York City, that's a whole universe unto itself. And, and that it's a, the most mature market there is, that, D.C., Chicago, you know, and California. And so yeah. certainly in those areas, the normal kind of retail channels are jam yes. of growers. You know, there are more farmer's markets than there are people that want to go to farmer's markets. And so yeah. for many growers in these, what I would call fairly saturated areas, farmer's market sales are steady or down. Yep. CSA sales steady or a little bit down because there's so many growers coming into the space and the demand is not keeping up with supply actually. Yep. And so those markets around here, they're full. Yep. And so it's up to new growers to figure out a way to get to open up a new piece, a new part of the market. And so they're going to have to figure out either how to become really good at growing a few things like 10 things and wholesaling them either yep. to, you know, doing that whole high touch restaurant wholesale. Yep. Then the next level would be kind of medium touch selling to farmer's market, uh, roadside stands and, and big CSAs yep. wholesale. So good wholesale or going for the institutional wholesale. Yes. So I think if I were a brand new grower, and when I work with brand new growers in this kind of situation, that's what I think is where the opportunity is. The restaurant appetite is huge. Yes. And they don't care about organic. They want hyper local. They want hyper local and hyper quality. Yep. And they want what they want. And you have to jump. And they say jump and you say how high. And yep. they say jump to here. And you say right on. I'm going to jump that high. Yes. I want my carrots this long. <laughs> <laughs> And, 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 and increasingly, they're willing to pay for it. They're willing yes. to pay for that high level of service. Yeah, I know Ray gets, for those very particular size carrots and beets, something ridiculous per pound. He's like, yeah, this is stupid. But the chefs want it so bad, I make it work in my system. Right. So yeah. that's for a place that's super saturated. And then for people that are you know, sort of out in the, in the boonies, then they have to start developing those market channels that we've all gotten used to. Then, then comes, oh, and you're the first CSA in town. Oh, yes. you're the big grower at the farmer's market. Look how nice their display is. This is a whole nother level, you know? Yeah. So yeah. for them, kind of almost anything is possible there. Absolutely. So I'm working with a grower in Nebraska right now who's um, really been doing an incredible job. And he's basically, yeah, he's selling to grocery stores, farmers markets. And because it's almost a food desert out there, because it takes so long to get good food out there, he's able to charge good prices. Prices I was charging in New York um, and Saratoga, which was a, 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 a hot market and just sell, you know, vast quantities of stuff. And again, his biggest limiting factor this year was his soils. So we had to work extensively on getting those fixed. Um, and, I, and he's really gotten it dialed in now, but um, it was definitely something that basically he couldn't meet demand because of that. Yeah. And the other thing that I think there's a tiny, another little bulge in, in possibility in the market is around what I would call a retro CSA. Oh, Right. So the way CSA has gone over time is basically left almost every aspect of the original impulse of CSA. Yes. Basically, you can have anything you want whenever you want it. 
well, that's the opposite. It was supposed to be, you can have what we have because this is what there is. Yes. <laughs> I visited a beautiful farm up in Massachusetts called Brookfield Farm, and they're the third CSA in the United States, and they're still yes. at it, year 36 or something. Yes. And they are 100% CSA. Yeah. That's, and they're all about offering the experience to the customers. Yeah. Of that's coming. a great farm. You have to come to the farm and you have to pick a few of the things. And there's just this tremendous sense of community. So they're not just selling food. They're selling yes. connection. Yeah. And that's what kind of is missing from today's world. And so if you can bring that connection, that community exactly. back into your CSA, it's over. You don't have to really compete anymore because people right. just want to be a part of that community. Exactly. You're offering something that no other, there's no other place to get it. You yeah. can't get it at Whole Foods. You can't get it at, even at a restaurant. Yeah. You are giving those people access to touch those plants, to let their children walk on that soil and pick the berries. I mean, it's a really beautiful thing at this farm. And I keep thinking it's time for more of those to come about. Now, the caveat being, if you're a brand new farmer, you're not ready to be a CSA yet. You've got to get your legs underneath you. You've yes. got a few years under your belt. But I'm saying, I think it's something to keep an eye on. Yeah, no, that's a really, really interesting point. And um, that's really cool. So keep that in your quiver when you start talking to somebody. Yeah, yeah, I've got actually a new farm that just contacted us down in Georgia, which is going to be tough because, again, the soils are the toughest down there. Yeah. But he's laying slate. And he spoke to me already that he really wants to be community and wants the members to be on the, the land doing things. And so I was like, that's something we you definitely want to talk about. Obviously, too, though, geography is a part of that, is that it needs to be near the customers. Yep. So if you're in the middle of the boondocks, that may not work. And so that's one thing we're going to be exploring with exactly where the land is and all that stuff. But you're, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I, I think it's still an option. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tell me about labor, because labor, I think, is another massive challenge of people. And obviously, with the size farm you had, you were dealing with labor. Absolutely. And labor's changing a lot, too. Um, over the years you were farming, how did labor change for you? And what do you think were the keys to keeping good people? So what I saw change, I mean, our labor structure was always to hire basically college, either yep. people in college or people who had already finished college, you know, so okay. kind of 19 to 24 year olds. Yes. Um, it was maybe a little bit younger than that, uh, way back 30 years ago. And we never done H2A and we've never had people from town who made a career of coming to work and pick vegetables. People who came for one season, maybe some of them came back. You know, they were there for a whole kind of life-altering experience of, of farm yeah. immersion program. Mm -hmm. So we paid them, we've always paid just straight wages for hours. But over time, what happened is more and more people started to be 22, 23, 24, 27, 28 years old, already finished college, already had two or three years in their quote, real job, and they hated it. And so they were saying, this is it. This is, I got where I was supposed to go and I don't like it. It's boring yeah. and soul sucking. And yeah. they're searching for a new way forward. And this, the idea of agriculture and good food is so attractive to so many young people now. And so our workers started to get more and more serious, you know, serious about farming. And this was their first or second or third dipping of their toe into the water to see, is this going to work for me? So yeah. that's the, the kind of pool that we've always used to keep our farm going. We didn't ever get into migrant labor and all kinds of more common yeah. sorts of things. Now with that though, too, if you're bringing new people on all the time, your training program had to be spot on. You really had to have your systems dialed in. Talk to us a little bit about that and what that means and how you pulled that off. Well, there's the manager, there's usually somebody beneath who's, you know, who's been there one or two or three years. And so you've got a little bit of a hierarchy of experience and having your systems figured out in advance you know what it is you want to do. All your ducks are in a row. You've got all your tools figured out and they're ready to go. You've got all the supplies. When it's time to mulch, the mulch is there on the wagon in advance. And then it just takes that 
time of teaching in the field with your hands, with everybody standing around and taking that new person right out there and saying, this is how we mulch tomatoes. Yes. And, and just, there's no substitute for taking that time to work right with them and then step away, go do something else and come back. You've mm-hmm. got to come back like within an hour and see how it's going. You know, so that it's that constant show and tell, go away, come back, see how it is, find out what the questions are, you know, learning that whole repeat after me, you know, Hey, Michael, I need you to go. I need you to get this, 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 and then head over there with those people. And I'll see you in 45 minutes. Okay, bye. You can't just do that. People are Mm -hmm. like, I don't get it. And you have to say, all right, now what is it you're going to do? And let them tell you. And then you say, right on, we're on the same page. And frequently, if they're teenagers, they just look at you like, um. (laughs) You talking to me, right? (laughs) So that's why I was like, okay, pull out your notepad and start writing. (laughs) I really like some of the inspirations that come out of the, of Ben Hartman's work with the lean farm. Yep. That, that communication system on the whiteboard. Yes. And this is for when everybody's up to a certain level of proficiency. Now we've got this, you know, a team of members who are independent thinking and doing units and the way they communicate on that board with these are the, you know, the red things need to be done the green things or, or whatever it is. Yeah. You know, this is done. This isn't done. The way they flip the magnet. There's a lot of good ideas in there. Oh, yeah. Yeah. He's got some really nice systems around that. Yeah. I mean, on our farm, we had a whiteboard in every single greenhouse and a whiteboard in the washing shed. And to us, one of the key whiteboards we had was the um, when I'm finished whiteboard. And this was where when they finished a task, instead of having to call someone on the radio or go find someone or go sit on the corner and check their phone, here's the 20 things that are the little tiny things that just need done, but we haven't had a chance to do that you can go do and you can make, keep yourself busy. Yep. Now, another thing, my, my partner, Hannah started this system. Okay. At her location, she had different people coming and starting at different times of the day and working all different part-timers with strangely and complicated overlap schedules. And so having one meeting in person to talk about what was happening wasn't going to work. She organizes by blog. And every day at night before she goes to bed, she writes on her blog what's going to happen, who's coming, at what time. What this person should do at 40 minutes after that, we're going to meet you there. And then we're all going to go over here. She's got it all like laid out. Everybody from wherever they are checks the blog so they know exactly what time the start is. You know, they know what to expect, what kind of supplies to wear, you know, what to wear, what to bring. And it's been very successful. Oh, absolutely. Because the biggest thing I see, the biggest time waster I see in farms is not necessarily doing stuff wrong because there's stuff done wrong. But the biggest time waster I see is when you're not organized, people standing because they can't do the next thing or it's not set up. It's not ready yet. You can, like that the night before, lay it out. That is a beautiful system. I mean, it sounds complicated to me because I would just tell my employees, okay, you just have to start at a certain time. I mean, we had certain employees because they were almost salaried that they did whatever the heck they wanted. And as long as their part of the farm worked, we didn't care what the hours they spent. The best. That's awesome. Yeah. But yeah, you're right. Having that that system set up so they know exactly who's doing what, when, how, that's a beautiful system. Right. I was much more of a, let's all meet at seven o'clock. Yeah. And we still have the whiteboard. But I I like, you know, in front of each other, touching each other, saying, hey, how's it going? Yeah. Eye contact, the whole, you know, and we'd like, I like to move as a team. I don't like having everybody go to a different place. I like to move as a team and get tons of stuff done. Bam, bam, bam. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I like working with the group. Yeah. Yeah. Working with a team, it's amazing to see how much you can get done. Absolutely. So, all right, we have gone almost an hour here. And so if you guys have questions, now's the time to drop them in the comments. I'm checking those comments right now. Um, Nicole's in there. We got Joseph. We've got Alexandra. So if you are uh, here and want to have a question for Ellen about the book, about farming, feel free to drop that right in. I'm going to finish with one question before we start taking people's questions. Um, Is you do talk about a chapter in the book about failure. 
And I think that's, you know, really important because I think a lot of people, one of the reasons a lot of people don't start farming is they're afraid of failure or they think they could never do farming. Um, one of the things that turns people off from farming is the failures. You, you try to grow tomatoes and they fall over because you don't use big enough stakes or they <laughs> split because there's too much water or, you know, you plant them too deep or too shallow. Um, so kind of lay out for us why failure is important. And, you know, back to your point of working for other people, so you make mistakes in other people's dollar. Yeah. Well, failure is how you find out is how you're going to learn. And so yeah. if you're overly careful in the sense that you're only going to do, you know, you're, you're not experimenting. If you're following too narrow of a line of advice that somebody gave you or something you read in the book and you're not innovating and trying out some new ideas and new approaches then one, it's going to get boring. And two, you're not going to get any better. And so failure is just what comes with that attitude of I'm trying to get better. And sometimes you have to fail in order to get better. You have to find out, oh, that's not going to work. And so yeah. I can check that off the list. And now I'm going to try this other way. Now, nobody enjoys it particularly, you know, especially if there's animals involved or, you know, we don't want to have failures that involve people getting hurt and all that kind of stuff. Um, I'm just talking about dead plants, you know? Yes. I mean, that feels bad, but it's not like having a dead animal for goodness sake. My gosh. So anyway, yeah. that's why we felt it was important to talk about failures. And actually, interestingly, in my little neighborhood, we had quite a lot of farmers where we'd get together once a year to have in the winter to have a big party, a big nerding out Party. Yes. And the best, the way we structured it was go around the room and say two things that you're never going to do again oh, ho. from this season, right? I don't want to hear about, you know, I grew the biggest cabbage ever. Wa-di-da. Tell me what you're never going to do again. Now okay. that's what I want to know. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So that's our idea about failure. It's nice. inevitable and important. Yes. That's great. Great point. Um, because yeah, I think every single year you are going to learn and especially with the farm with so many moving pieces, there's going to be things that you're going to try and be like, whoops, this was a bad mistake. Um, one of the failures we made is we tried to change a complete system in one year without testing it first. We said, you know, we were struggling with beet germination. So we're like, oh, we're going to start transplanting all our beets. Well, first three transplanting sessions in the greenhouse had 0% germ. We were out without beets for a month. And if we had at least, you know, tried 50-50, at least we would have had some beets. Yeah. So there's failures, super important and you're going to do it, but yeah. and don't let you stop you from trying, but yeah. But within reason, Ben yes. Hartman has what he calls the 15% rule. And that yes. is only allow yourself to try 15% new method, new variety, new yep. market and have 85% that you already know how it works. That's yes. as much risk as he thinks is makes sense in terms yes. of trying new, new ideas on the farm. Yeah. And cool. you don't want to have zero. Yes. Or That's else you're stagnant. Right. Yeah. Um, Stace has a great question. So what makes a qualified farm consultant and what questions should you ask before hiring them? Good question. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, you know, from a outside perspective, I don't think there are any certifications or any, you know, letters that would come after somebody's name. Basically, I would go on word of mouth. You know, I would go on somebody having had a good experience and saying, yeah, I worked with Ellen and it really helped, you yeah. know? So, you know, that kind of track record of having success working with people and some kind of experience, you know, some kind of credential or some kind of experience in the thing that you need consulting on, you know? So if somebody's only worked on a farm for three years, it's going to be hard for me to take their advice on how to farm, right? Between those two, you know, good word of mouth and, you know, some fairly developed body of experience. I think those two things um, yeah. matters the most. Well, and I think if they resonate with you too. So, I mean, there's right. some farm consultants which are great in what they do, but they're never going to be able to help certain people. Um, they're going to speak the language in a way that it works. Yeah. Yeah. And I think there's some people too, which are just natural teachers. Um, and so that always helps too. 
Yeah. Um, and there's some people which just get really frustrated by, you know, some of the itsy bitsy questions, which those are sometimes the most important questions that you get asked. Exactly. Um, but what I find is that people talk about tough business to make a living in is trying to get farmers to pay you to talk to them, right? That's yeah. my, new, my new business. I mean, talk about a group of people that doesn't want to give it up. And so it's an interesting dilemma to be on this side of the equation now. But what I find is that just the act of deciding that you're going to ask for help and then deciding you're going to pay somebody for that help, growers that I work with do all this homework to get ready to talk to me. And it's almost sometimes as if even if they didn't talk to me, they've done all these things that they knew they were supposed to do. But it's like having it's like having an appointment at the gym, right? Yes. And you want to prove to your coach or your trainer that you can lift the weight. It's like having somebody witness you in your process Absolutely. really yeah. helps you push yourself along. It's pretty interesting relationship. I really am really enjoying it. Yeah, no, that's awesome. That's awesome. Now, Joseph asks, what's the most common thing that you see small farms fail with? Um, I think he means maybe enterprise. I don't know if he means like specific enterprises or just across any business. Well, I think across the business to me would be, well, I see two things, obviously, and then there's a lot more, but two major things is one, weed control. If you can't control your weeds, you're wasting most of your time just looking for vegetables. And because they're competition, they don't grow as well. So you have to grow more of them. The second thing with me would be too, is not keeping the right records. So you don't know where you're failing and where you're succeeding. Ooh, good ones. I like yours. My first answer is doing too many different things. Yes. Oh, too broad diversity overly diversified. They want to have chickens and pigs and cows and vegetables, and they're going to do this kind of market, this kind of market, and this kind of market, and they're just scattered. And have a brewery. Yeah. Oh, let's do that too. And I have some little children. (laughs) Which is its own farm. (laughs) But we already talked about how difficult it is to have a farm at all, where you're using all these different hats. So now you have all those hats, and then you're going to make it three times more complicated because you've got three enterprises. You know, you've got the bees, the salad, and the sheep. And it's like one human being just cannot wear that many hats. Yeah, it's 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 switching so fast. It's too hard. And one of the biggest reasons we actually really streamlined our business and actually I took a lot less projects on was because I felt like I was switching projects so much by the time I got the speed of the new project, I was wasting half my time doing that. In the transition. In the transition. I think that's the same thing with farmers is that one of the things that we tried to do, we tried to do two things very unsuccessfully on our farm. And I don't know why we did because we were incredibly successful at vegetables um, is we tried to do prepared foods. So we tried to take our product and turn it into something else. And then we also tried to dabble in chickens and turkeys. And while they both made some cash, and I think when we look at the numbers, the prepared foods actually, of course, lost us some money. The turkeys, I think, did make us some money. But that was not us. And it was, it was trying wow. to do too many things. And I couldn't focus well on all of them. Yeah. And the biggest thing with that is that, you know, if I had had somebody that I could have tasked completely with the animals and they completely took care of it and that was their thing and right. they were completely 100% in charge, that would have been one thing. But I was trying to, as one farmer, manage all those enterprises and it just was it's incredibly hard. Right. It's psychologically too many things. Yeah. I'm with you. All right. Thanks, Ellen. Got to run. Your book is in my Audible queue, which is awesome. I will go ahead and actually drop the link, pin the post here, the comment here with your book in it so people can go ahead and grab that. And um, again, Ellen, thank you so much for coming on. This was great and uh, hope to have you on in the future. That was fun. Take care, everybody. So there you have it. Another episode in the books. So I'd love if you would hop on over to iTunes and leave us a rating and a review. Those mean everything to us. We love to hear what you're thinking. If you have a podcast guest that you can recommend, please pop on over to the Thriving Farmer podcast website and leave us a review. That's thrivingfarmerpodcast.com.